you, but did you hear what I read in the first John passage? It has these powerful words. I mean, it tells us about the greatest commandment being love. But then it says, if you have all that you need, if you have all that you need, how can you look at someone who needs help and not give them help? If you have the world's goods and see someone who hurts, how can you not help? And then it says a message that I think is so critically important for us here in the United States right now. It says, Beloved, let us love, not in words or speech, but in truth and action. Our words and speech have been appalling lately. Appalling. Everywhere we turn, people have, and I think it's the whole worst trapped in our houses still, but people are just mean. Everywhere you turn, every social media platform you enter, people are saying the harshest, meanest, rudest things you have ever heard. And this passage says, what did I tell you? Love one another. Love one another. Let your words and your speech not just be performative, not just be, I'm a Christian because I go to church. I'm a Christian because I believe in Jesus. Let your words dictate the truth and action. And we've forgotten what truth is. We've forgotten that there really is truth. And we've decided that any voice that appears can be listened to and seen as true. But that's not what the scripture tells us, right? It tells us that God has told us what is true. Love one another. How do we do that? How do we practice that? How do we live out that promise, that belief, that our actions are as important as any words we speak, but the words we speak need to show the truth. A couple weeks ago, I was listening to NPR, and there was a review of a book, and it got me really excited about the person that they were speaking to about an article she had in the book. And it was about black farmers in America. And they talked to Leah Peniman, who is a farmer educator in upstate New York. She used to be a science teacher, but she always tried to figure out how she could grow food in her, her area. And someday, one day, somebody asked her, or many people kept asking her, why don't you start your own farm? Grow your own food. And so her and her husband, who loved the process of growing, decided to start a farm in Upper New York State. And in the process of starting this farm, they started to think about how do we produce food that we eat? How do we share that food with those who are around us? And how do we make sure that the earth we're living on is benefited by the production we're creating. And so in the process of creating their farm, they changed the style of farming that they did. And I went to find her essay, but I, of course, since I heard it weeks ago, I couldn't find the book that was written, you know, because she's not the main editor. But what I found and what I started doing was following her farm, Soul Fire Farm. And amazing things happen at this farm. They have set it up to be 
a cooperative, meaning that they put the land that they purchased into trust. And that trust is used in a number of ways. One element of which is, um, I don't know if you've seen this performative liberal thing that people do. And I don't know how I feel about it because it's a real need, but it's words, not action. Okay? So the performative thing that liberals do is they go tell you what land they stand on before they start anything. Okay? So I've tried to discover what land we stand on, but there could be four different tribes, and I haven't gone down to the historical society to find out who the actual Squaw Grove, which is a totally offensive word, by the way. <laughs> Who the actual Native Americans were that were put there. Um, so that's why I have never done the liberal performative thing of saying this is who the land belongs to. Because it's unclear which of the tribes actually had this such a But what Leah did, and what her cooperatives did, is that they discovered that the land they were on was from the Stockbridge-Muncie band of the Mohicans. And instead of doing just performative words, saying this is whose land we now occupy, they felt it was necessary to create re real relationships with the people who were pushed and moved into Wisconsin. And so they started actually developing friendships and relationships and learning from the people whose land they are on. And they decided to set aside part of their land, create an easement on it for into perpetuity, where they could always come to perform their sacred rituals and to do wild crafting. So that the land itself could be open for them to come to and not be restricted from. And they started a seed exchange that they, because they had developed the relationships, the real physical, I know you and I trust you relationships with them, the Native Americans started sharing their seeds and told them about how they planted the seeds, the, the actual process of using those seeds and putting them in the ground in the specific way their ancestors had done it for forever. And Leah and her farm took those seeds and started growing the food in the way that it had been grown for thousands and thousands of years before we came. And they gathered those seeds and sold those seeds and the fruit and used the proceeds to benefit the Native Americans that the seed comes from. Love one another, not just in your words, but in your actions in the real relationships you create, in the need you see, in the ability to draw close to the other and learn from them. Another example from Soul Fire Farm. It tells the story of a bus coming because they do educational events with the community groups they have formed in low wealth, poor areas, that the kids can come to the farm and experience what it means to learn to grow their food and to take that food back with them. And she talks about one of the buses coming and one of the young people, he left his headphones on and refused to take off his refused to get off the bus because he didn't want his sneakers to get dirty because they were the sneaker, you know. And even after Leah started talking to him about the farm, because she says among 
black Americans. There's this disconnect with the land because they remember the slavery attached to land. That they were forced to work so hard on the land. And so then when they get to a spot where they're invited into a new relationship with the land and to retake up that ability to farm, some of them just shut down and stop because they're stuck in a legitimate fear of what the land had been and had been done to them because of farming. And so she tried talking to him and she says, I think he changed his mind when he realized everybody else was out of the vehicle and he was stuck near the woods by himself. And he joined into the activities of the group. And she says, after they got to a point where they were actually digging into the soil and working up the soil, he shared about his grandmother and how his grandmother had always grown her own vegetables. And his eyes and his feeling and his sense of worth and the importance of the land all changed in that remembrance of how important the land was to his grandmother. Leah takes her role, her place and position as a black farmer in America seriously but takes her knowledge, her deep knowledge, that she has been given the gift and the ability to share what she has with the world. She takes those words, those words which if you read through some of her and her sister's poetry, talk about love and connection, she takes those words and makes the action real. That's what 1 John is inviting us to do, right? 1 John is inviting us to remember that those words, love one another, aren't just words. They aren't just the words you reflexively tell people when you, yeah, you're asked, what do you believe? They're meant to influence your life, to change how you live, so that you can reflect what Jesus taught. So that you can reflect this idea that if anybody is in need and you have the ability to help, you need to help. Love one another. Beloved. Let us love not in word or speech, but in truth and action. Amen.